everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Hoops and Heels Women Sports Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. My name is Samantha Genzer. I'm going to be your guys' show host as always. Happy 4th of July for whoever celebrates it. We have a very exciting episode for you guys. We're going to be covering the difference between the 2020 gymnastics team and the 2024 gymnastics team, predictions for Olympic golf, the full team USA track and field roster, recap of the NORCACA Pan American Cup Final Six, and make sure you guys stay to the end of the show to hear about the top competitors for the US and US WNT in the Olympic Games. Where we begin, I wanted to ask you guys to like and follow the show as always, and to become a part of our show to tip and donate using the link gsmcpodcast.net. Thursdays and Friday's show will be different as these are pre-recorded, so there are no live comments or questions, but we will resume all of that on Monday. So yes, yeah, so right now I am filming at 2 a.m. on Thursday, July 4th, so happy 4th of July, but yeah, so these are pre-recorded. So there's none of that like live streaming and all that fun stuff, unfortunately. But we're resuming that Monday, so all will be good. But still, I just wanted to remind you guys that you can tip and donate using that link anytime. And you can, of course, follow and like the show anytime as well. So now that we've got that out of the way, we can start talking about the gymnastics teams. Okay, so this is so weird. Like when I'm filming, like, live streaming, I feel like I'm talking to myself, but, like, I know that people are on, so it's, like, fine. You know what I'm saying? But, like, now that I, like, am literally aware that I'm literally talking to myself, I'm, like, I don't know. But, you know what? We're all talking to ourselves all the time, but we just, like, you know, like, my mind's constantly going. So, constantly have inner monologue or dialogue, whatever you want to call it. So, we're still talking to ourselves just now out loud, I guess. Anyway, I'm going it's 2 a.m. Give me a break. Anyway, so to start the show, we are going to compare the 2020 gymnastics Olympic team to the 2024 gymnastics Olympic team. A lot of changes can happen in four years. People get older, they retire, people get injured, people get better. So the team is obviously very different from the 2020 Olympics, but there are still the, some of the same people on the team. In fact, literally, it looks like the exact same team sometimes. Um, the 2020 Olympic team consisted of six people, whereas this year's team only consists, consists of five people. Simone Biles, Sinisa Lee, Jordan Childs, Grace McCollum, Jay Carey, and Michaela Skinner were on the 2020 team. And this year we have Simone Biles, Sinisa Lee, Jordan Childs, Jay Carey, and Hesley Rivera. Now you're probably thinking, wow, that team is basically the exact same. And yes, that's true. These are four people returning to the 2024 Olympics on the team, but we are adding a new person to this year's team and we're losing two of some of the most well-known US gymnasts. So in this segment, we are going to compare and contrast what this year's team is bringing to the table compared to the 2020 Olympic team by going over each gymnast's strengths, weaknesses, et cetera, all that. So let's start talking about Simone Biles. Now, Simone Biles having won gold in the all-around team vault and floor exercises while claiming bronze in the balance beam in the Rio 2016 Olympics. There was a lot of pressure and expectations on her in the 2020 Olympics. At the 2020 Olympics, she added two more medals to her Olympic tally, making it a remarkable seven. However, she made headlines by withdrawing from most events, citing mental health concerns. Her struggles with the quote twisties, a disoriented mental block during aerial maneuvers, were laid bare. Bio's decision to prioritize her mental well-being sparked vital conversations about the immense pressures athletes face and their mental health challenges. Since then, she has become an advocate for mental health. After a significant hiatus following Tokyo, where she tied the knot with fellow athlete Jonathan Owens, Biles received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from U.S. President Biden. She won five new medals, including four goals, and amassed a total of 30 career medals at the 2023 World Artistic Gymnastics Championships in Belgium. So Biles' perspective on success has evolved. She said, quote, success to me means something a little bit different now before everyone decides to find success for me, even though I had my own narrative. Now it's about showing up, being in a good mental space, having fun, and letting whatever happens, happens, unquote. So in the upcoming Olympics, she will be bringing that same fire and energy she brought to the 2020 and 2016 Olympics and more. I think Biles will lead in all events other than the bars. And that's probably like a hard opinion to make. She has been consistent all year round. And especially in the Xfinity Championship, she showed how dominant she is by claiming literally first in every single event. I think she won't. 
this is a hard opinion to make. I don't think she will dominate as much on the bars, considering that is her weakest event. And there are other competitors from other countries that I'm seeing might place better than she does in the bars. With her unparalleled skill set and difficulty level, she is a favorite to win the gold medal in literally everything, though. So, like, you have to consider that. Hopefully, with her improved idea of success and journey and mental health, she feels mentally okay to take on the challenges of the Olympics and will be, will have more, you know, coping mechanisms for the twisties if that issue does arise. But hopefully, all goes well. Next, bringing back Sunisa Lee is an amazing decision for the USA team. She's the reigning all-around champion from the 2020 Olympics. Lee's versatility and strength across all four apparatus make her a strong contender for the all-around title once again. But I do think Biles might beat her in that. <laughs> in Tokyo, she demonstrated, Lee demonstrated remarkable composure and skill, clinching the gold medal with a score of 57.433. Lee's expertise on the uneven bars is well documented. She is renowned for her intri intricate and high difficulty routines, including a signature, and I'm going to be pronouncing this incorrectly, literally all gymnastics goes I cannot pronounce correctly at all. That is just a fun little fact. Um, so I sincerely apologize, but one of her like high difficulty routines, like signature moves is the Nabiva, which is a laid out, I can't say this one either, Tachev, it's T-K-A-C-H-E-V, that one. Um, if y'all saw, a, if I could show you guys a video, y'all would, would be like, oh, we've seen that. So like, it's fine. But her combination skills like the Nabiva 2 pa Pak Salto. <laughs> I literally cannot pronounce any skill. It's so bad. I sincerely apologize. So yeah, so that's like what makes her stand out on the uneven bars. At the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, her uneven bars earned her a score of 15.3 in the team final and 15.2 in the individual all-around final, securing a bronze medal in that event with a final score of 14.5. For the 2024 Olympics, if she maintains or increases her difficulty while refining her execution, she has a strong chance of potentially winning gold on the uneven bars or medaling. The vault is another area where Lee has shown potential. In Tokyo, she performed a strong Gruchenko double twist, earning a score of 14.6 in the all-around final. To be competitive on vault and Paris, she may need to consider adding more difficulty such as upgrading to an Aminar, which is a Yurchenko two and a half double twist. Two and a half twist, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> what am I, I'm literally so sorry. But with an increased difficulty in clean execution, Lee could be a contender for a vault medal, though this event typically sees very fierce competition from gymnasts specializing in powerful vaults like Simone Biles and Jordan Childs, which leads me to Jordan Childs here. So she contributed to the 2020 Olympics with a <clears throat> now I'm losing my voice. Sorry, guys. With a strong vault performance and floor routine, for Paris, Childs might consider upgrading her vault to increase her difficulty score, which could position her as a medal contender in this event. And she has done exactly that this year. The floor exercise is where Childs truly shines, combining powerful tumbling passes with impressing dance elements. Y'all know I'm obsessed with her floor routines because she has so much like personality and attitude into it. Her floor routines are crowd pleasers, characterized by high energy and that dynamic choreography. In the Tokyo Olympics, her floor routine was a highlight, contributing significantly to the team's score. For Paris, Childs will look to maintain her high difficulty level and focus on clean landings to maximize her score. Her artistic presentation and powerful tumbling could make her a strong contender for a floor exercise medal. And I, I hope that she gets it, just because, like, she deserves it. <laughs> and, like, I'm literally, like, I always have so much fun watching hers. So I'm like, if we could, like, give out, like, a just, like, most fun and creative floor routine, like I would give it to her. Jade Carey secured a gold medal on the floor exercise in the 2020 Olympics. Oh my gosh, someone just subscribed to the channel and I got a notification of it, but I thought I was live streaming on accident and I was like, oh my gosh, that is not. Anyway, we're good here, guys. I'm actually recording, so we're fine. But anyway, so Jade Carey secured a gold medal on the floor exercise in the 2020 Olympics. And, you know, she's looking to do just that again and more in the 2024 Olympics. Carey's floor routines are renowned for their high difficulty and powerful tumbling passes. She consistently performs some of the most challenging passes in the world, including a double twisting double layout and the triple twisting double tuck. Her routine in Tokyo earned her the highest honors thanks to her combination of power, artistry, and precision. In Paris, Carey will aim to increase her execution scores while maintaining the high difficulty that makes her a standout on the floor. Carey is also one of the leading vaulters in the world. While she did not medal in vault at the Tokyo Olympics, she has consistently been a top competitor in this event at various international competitions. 
Carrie typically performs high difficulty vaults such as the Chang, which is a Yurchenko half on front layout with one and a half twist, and the Aminar, like I said, which is a Yurchenko two and a half twist. Both vaults have high difficulty scores, and Carrie's ability to execute them with minimal deduction sets her apart from her competitors. For Paris, if she maintains her form and possibly adds new elements to her vaults, she will be a strong favorite to medal or being the top five in this event for sure. So Hezu Rivera was not on the 2020 team, and that's because she's literally only 16 years old right now. Like, imagine she would literally be 12 years old if she was on the team last Olympics. Rivera's recent performances have been particularly impressive. For instance, her beam routine at the 2023 World Championship showcased her ability to execute high difficulty skills with minimal deductions. Her routine includes complex combinations such as a back handspring to layout step out series and a front arrow to split jump, which adds to her difficulty score. Rivera's clean execution and artistic presentation make her a strong contender for a medal on the balance beam in Paris. I also found her floor exercise to be particularly noteworthy. Rivera's floor routines are marked by her powerful tumbling and artistic flair. Her ability to combine difficult tumbling passes with impressive choreography makes her routines engaging and high scoring. I think she's a contender for meddling in the beam, but it will be difficult for a medal in probably any other event, in my opinion. Beam is just where she like particularly is really dominant. Now, let's talk about two other people who are no longer on the roster. Grace McCollum placed fourth in the all-around in the Olympics. She also finished fourth on floor exercise, sixth on eating bars, and fifth on balance beam. Michaela Skinner was the 2020 Olympic vault silver medalist and was an alternate for the 2016 Olympic team. Despite finishing in 11th place and the all-around in fourth place on the vault at the 2020 Games, she did not qualify to either final due to two per country limitations. In my opinion, this year's team is way stronger than the 2020 Olympic team, which gives them a better chance of winning that gold medal. First off, Simone Biles has improved tremendously. She's a powerhouse and leads in literally every event. But then you also have Jordan Child slain in the vault, Jay Carey slain in floor, Hezu Revere dominating the beam, and Sunisa Lee literally doing amazing in everything and as the all-around champion. I have a lot of faith in this year's team, and I am a huge fan of every single one of them. They all bring something new to the table, and they all have their strengths. And even if they do not have some, even if they do have some sort of weakness, some other teammate could they basically cover it for them by bringing up the score in the event that they are strong as like. If that makes sense, I really hope that makes sense. So we're now gonna switch into the next segment where we talk about Olympic golf predictions. Before we get started in that, we're gonna be taking a very short break. So I will see you guys very soon. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Is everybody in the world blind? Please Lord, give me a sign, a sign. I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world die? Please Lord give me a sign, a sign I wanna be the greatest Everybody on the face shit I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest I make this every day and I'm impatient Hoping one day I blow up from the basement Statement, the top is so vacant I don't need shit that I think is amazing Waiting for my day when I'm playing Sold out shows for a thousand faces Hey, give me that crown Get in my way and you'll be put down It ain't your place, all this my town If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now I'm losing it, the noose it fits Some loose shit, a stupid myth You choose to live or choose to dip You choose to fight or lose your grip And lose a gift, oh I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please Lord give me a sign, a sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Welcome back everybody to the GSMC Hoops and Heels Women's Sports Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. We just got done talking about the 2020 Tokyo Gymnastics Team compared to the 2024 Paris Gymnastics Team and now we're going to talk about Olympic golf and my predictions. Before we start, I do want to apologize for this lighting. This is not the best lighting. I am not, I'm not a fan of it, but it's because I usually have like natural lighting like right ahead of me, but it is... 2 a.m. So there is no light outside. It is pitch black out there. So that's just not happening. Natural lighting is not a thing right now. Um, so that's why the lighting is so bad. Okay. So 
I am not the best <laughs> at making predictions for golf. Y'all know that. Whenever I make predictions for golf, whatever the tournament is, I literally am always totally wrong. So, but I'm always like somewhere right. Like I always have like ability to know like, okay, like I'm not saying that I'm great at predicting, but I know who the top competitors are. You know what I'm saying? Like if you follow golf enough, you realize who the top competitors are, if that makes sense. But my predictions are not always like the most solid predictions. That's my point. So I'm going to give my top five predictions, like not in any specific order, like top five people. And then my six to 10th place people, not any specific order as well. Just like that category, six to 10th place people. And then lastly, I'll give my opinions on who I think will end up in 11th to 15th place range. If that makes any sense. I hope it makes sense. Um, so let's start off with who I think will end up in first to fifth place. And I'm just going to clarify that this is not any specific. Well, actually, this one is because I do have certain people who I'm like, they could definitely be strong contenders for the medal. So like I have top three, but this is not in any order, really. Does that make any sense? I really hope that makes sense. Anyway, so we're just going to we're just going to get started before I confuse myself even more. OK, so here are the people I think will land in the top five. Nellie Korda, Lilia Vu, Yuka Sasso, Minji Lee and Charlie Hull. Specifically, I think Nellie Korda, Lilia Vu and Yuka Sasso have a strong chance of meddling. Nellie Korda is competing for the USA team. She stands out for her consistency and precision. She's rock solid when it comes to driving, iron play and putting, making her a tough competitor to beat. Her calmness under pressure is a big plus also. When it comes to iron play, she's top notch, notch <laughs> hitting greens and regulations like it's second nature. This means she gets more birdie, birdie chances and fewer boogies. Her short game is just as impressive. Whether it's chipping or putting, Nelly knows how to recover from tricky spots and nail those crucial putts. Her fitness also plays a huge role. With a powerful swing and great endurance, she can handle the toughness of the course. Nellie's no stranger to Olympic success. She grabbed the gold medal in women's golf in the Tokyo Olympics. Besides that, she bagged multiple major championships, including the women's PGA Championship and the several and has several LPGA Tour wins under her belt, always ranking among the top players globally. This year, Nellie has continued to shine. She's racked up more LPGA Tour wins and consistently finished in the top 10 in various tournaments. She is currently ranked first in the world, but what does concern me about her is that she has not been successful in the last couple of competitions. She was cut from the KPMG Women's PGA Championships, Mayor LPGA Classic, and US Women's Open. So Lilia Vu is also competing for the USA team. She is known for her incredible consistency and precision. Precision. Wow, my bad. She's got a great all-around game, but her iron play really sets her apart. Vu hits greens and regulation like it's no big deal, giving her plenty of birdie chances and keeping her scores low. Her, shot, her short game is equally impressive, whether she's chipping from the fringe or sinking putts. Vu's skills shine. She's also in great shape, which helps her maintain power and focus throughout long tournaments. She's had a remarkable career so far. She's won several titles on the LPGA Tour, showcasing her talent and determination. Specifically, in 2024, Vu has continued to build on her impressive re resume. She's secured multiple wins on the LPGA Tour and has consistently finished in the top 10 in various tournaments. She was second at the, uh, the HSBC Women's Champion, first at the Mayor LPGA Classic, and second at the KPMG Women's PGA Championship. Yuko Sasso is known for her powerful drives and accuracy, making her a formidable force on the golf course. She is competing for Japan, and she is ranked 10th globally. But I don't think that current ranking is going to stop her from meddling. Her ability to hit long, straight shots gives her a significant advantage, especially on longer courses. Yuko Sasso's precision with her irons is also top-notch, consistently setting herself up for birdie, birdie opportunities. Her short game is solid, and she's known for her ability to make crucial putts under pressure. She won the 2021 U.S. Women's Open, becoming the first Filipino to win a major golf championship, and that's really when I feel like she got her name out there. And then this year, she was first at the U.S. Women's Open, but this time she was representing Japan. She isn't very consistent in her placing. I'll admit that, which does worry me, worry me a bit. But I think she's got that potential to secure a bronze medal, maybe. This might be a strange prediction, though, just looking at her past performances, so I do understand that. 
I'm predicting fourth and fifth will come down to Minji Lee from Australia and Charlie Hole from Great Britain. Minji Lee is known for her precise driving and iron play, consistently hitting fairways and greens and regulation. Lee currently ranks 11th globally and she was fourth in the Blue Bay LPGA, seventh at the Cognizant Founders Cup and ninth at the U.S. Women's Open. In 2021, Lee won her first major championship, the Amundi Evian Championship, and then Charlie Goal is ranked 8th and finished 10th at the Dio and Plan LA Open and 7th at the HGV Tournament of Champions. Hull is known for her powerful and accurate drives, which gives her a significant advantage off the tee. She also has Olympic experience as she competed in the 2016 Rio Olympics, finishing in the top 20. The people I think will end up in the 6th to 10th place category are Hannah Green, Athai Thetical, Rose John, Kojin Young, and Brooke Henderson. Hannah Green will be competing for Australia, and she's ranked seventh in the world. This year, she finished first at the JM Eagle LA Championship and second at the Mizuho Americas Open. She is known for her consistent play, particularly her ability to hit fairways and greens in regulation. Green also represented Australia in the 2020 Olympics, finishing in that top 10. She has the potential to end up in the top 10 again, for sure. Athai Athetical will be representing Thailand, and she's ranked 12th in the world. This year, she placed 8th at the Mayer LPJ Classic, 4th at the ShopRite LPJ Classic, 6th at the US Women's Open, and 7th at the Mizuho Americas Open, and 5th at the CME Group Tour Championships. She clearly excels in pretty much all aspects of the game, from driving to putting. Considering her recent successes, it seems that it would make more sense for me to predict she ends up in the top 5. And I'm sure she could definitely make that possible, but it's her first Olympic appearance, and I think it's a safer bet to say that she would end up in the 6th to 10th range. Rose Jean is known for her technical proficiency and precise ball strikings. Since turning professional, she has quickly made an impact with several top finishes. She is representing the U.S. and is ranked 9th right now. She finished first this year at the Cognizant Founders Cup, which was a huge spotlight moment for her in her career. Kojin Young is ranked third and is representing Korea. She placed 10th at the HSBC Women's Champion, 4th at the JM Eagle LA Championships, and 2nd at the KPMG Women's PGA Championships. She's renowned for her precise driving and accurate iron play. She maintains a calm and focused demeanor, even in high-pressure situations. Brooke Henderson is representing Canada and is ranked 14th. Henderson started getting lots of attention after winning a major championship, the 2016 KPMG Women's PGA Championship. Henderson represented Canada in the 2020 Olympics, finishing in the top 10. I obviously hope that she can do it again. Specifically this year, she's on a good track considering she finished third at the Chevron Championships. Lastly, the people I think will be in the 11th to 15th place range are Lydia Ko, Celine Boudier, Amy Yang, Gim Rioan, and Leona McGuire. Lydia Ko is known for her versatility and adaptability on the golf course. Her short game is one of the best with exceptional chipping and putting skills. Lydia won the silver medal at the 2016 Rio Olympics and also finished in the top 10 at the 2020 Olympics. This year, she finished fourth at the Blue Bay LPGA, and that was her only top 10 finish this year in the LPGA Tour, so that is a bit alarming, which is why I have her in 11th to 15th rather than the top 10. Celine Boudier's strengths are her iron play and her ability to set up good scoring opportunities. Celine competed in the 2020 Olympics, finishing the top 20, and she's going to represent France and is ranked six globally. Amy Yang is known for her powerful and accurate drives. She competed in the 2016 Olympics and the 2020 Olympics, finishing the top 20 both times. I think that consistency will help her with confidence this year. Her successes this year are she finished in 10th at the HSBC Women's Champion and first at the recent KPMG Women's PGA Championships. Representing China, Yin Ronan is a rising star with immense talent. Yin has quickly made a name for herself with several victories and top finishes in her young and early career. She's ranked fourth right now in the world. She recently won the Dow Championships last weekend with the Thiathetical. Representing Ireland, I'm thinking Leona Maguire can finish in the 11th to 15th range. Leona competed in the 2020 Olympics, finishing in the top 20. Her short, short game, particularly her putting, is highly effective. This year, she finished in 5th at the HSBC Women's Champion. That is her only top 10 finish in the LPGA Tour this year, but it was a very solid tournament for her. So we're now going to move into our next segment where we talk about the full team roster for U.S. track and field in the Olympics. 
focusing mainly on the field events. Before we get into that, we're going to be taking a very short break, so I will see you guys very soon. Looking for your daily fix of sports talk without having to pay for it? GSMC Sports Network is available on YouTube. Just search GSMC Sports Network. Get your fix of daily sports talk shows on YouTube absolutely free. NFL, college football, NBA, MLB, MMA, UFC, fantasy football, and so much more. GSMC Sports Network has shows running all day long with new sports shows starting every two hours. Just like on your favorite cable sports channel, except GSMC Sports Network is absolutely free. Just search GSMC Sports Network on YouTube to catch one of your new favorite shows, like the GSMC College Football Podcast, Chip Shot Football Podcast, Hoops and Heels Women's Sports Podcast, GSMC Basketball Podcast, and so many more. Check it out for yourself. GSMC Sports Network, now available on YouTube absolutely free. Search GSMC Sports Network on YouTube right now. Welcome back, everybody, to the GSMC Hoops and Heels Women's Sports Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. We just got done talking about my predictions for Olympic golf, and now we're going to talk about the full team roster for Team USA track and field. For the last two days, we have been talking about track events, and now we're going to continue our conversation and finish up by talking about who's competing in the field events. At the end, we will conclude with the marathon, which is technically considered a track event, um but it's obviously not a field event but just ignore that i did not follow the pattern there at the end (laughs) so starting with the women's discus we have a lot to get through so we're just going to get right into it so starting with the women's discus we have valerie allman Jaden ulrich and veronica fraley allman won the gold medal in the 2020 olympics she then earned bronze at the 2022 world athletics championship which made her the first american woman to win a world championship medal in the discus throw and later added a silver medal at the 2023 world championships she is the north america record holder for the event Jaden ulrich is a current student at the university of Louisville. in june she finished second in the women's discus with a throw of 63.05 meters at the 2024 ncaa d1 track and field championships Competing for Vanderbilt University, Veronica Fraley became the first female athlete to win the discus throw combination for Vanderbilt at the Southeastern Conference Championships, throwing a lifetime best of 62.84 meters. In August 2023, she competed at the 2023 World Athletics Championships in Budapest, and then in April 2024, she set a new personal best of 67.70 meters at the Oklahoma Throw Series meeting in Ramona. I definitely think Almond will be able to medal, but Ulrich has a better chance of placing in the top five or top ten. There's a lot of competition in this event, and for literally every event, I think these three will need to watch out. What I mean by, I just realized that didn't make any sense. I think there's going to be competition, like so much competition for all events, but for specifically for this event, there's just like hiding competition that just makes it hard to predict. And I think these three in the discus will need to watch out for Sandra Perkovic from Croatia, the two-time Olympic gold medalist from the 2012 and 2016 games, Yami Perez from Cuba, the bronze medalist from the Tokyo Olympics, Herende Van Klinken from the Netherlands, and Kristen Pundes from Germany, the silver medalist from the Tokyo Olympics. In the women's hammer throw, we have a net, and I'm so sorry, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, most likely, Iche Konwoke, Deanna Price, and Aaron Reese. Iche Konwoke was due to represent Nigeria at the 2020 Olympics, but was disqualified due to the, ne- the negligence of the Athletic Federation of Nigeria. Whole big issue there. Before that, she won the weight throw event at the 2017 NCAA Championship, also becoming the University of Cincinnati's first NCAA champion in track and field. Price's personal best 
in the hammers 80.31 meters the american record set at the 2020 u.s olympic trials the throw ranked her as the number two women's thrower in history on 17th of February 2024, Reese became national champion in the weight throw with a distance of 25.73 meters in New Mexico. This is in place her second all-time in the discipline. These three's biggest competition will be Anita Waldrasich from Poland and Wang Zhan from China, but I do think that Ichi Kunwoke could medal and the same with Deanna Price for sure. For the women's high jump, we have two people on the U.S. team, and those people are Rachel Glenn and Vashni Cunningham. Glenn initially competed in athletics as a 400-meter runner before switching to high jump in 2018. Shortly afterwards, she recorded a height of 1.80 meters at the Cal Relays at El Camino College. In her first year at the University of South Carolina, Glenn won the SEC Outdoor Championships and the 2021 NCAA Division I Outdoor Track and Field Championship title. In 2023, she transferred to the University of Arkansas, and in February 2024, she set an indoor personal best of 1.90 meters at the Tyson Invitational at Randall Tyson Track Center in Fayetteville. Cunningham was in the 2020 games, and she finished sixth at the 2022 NCAC Championship. She finished in first. Their biggest competition will be Maria Lazikin from Russia, the reigning Olympic champion from the Tokyo Games. Yaroslava Munhenchik from Ukraine, the silver medalist, and Nicola McDermott from Australia. I think both U.S. competitors here have a chance to finish in the top five, but it definitely will be difficult, and I am more optimistic about them finishing in the top ten. In the javelin, we only have one U.S. competitor, and that would be Maggie Malone Harden. She holds a personal record of 67.40 meters for the event, set in 2021, which was a national record. She was the 2016 American National and Collegiate Record Holder and NCAA Division I Champion. She is the Amer American Collegiate Record Holder as well. Her biggest competitors will be Kelsey Lee Barber from Australia, who is the reigning world champion and bronze medalist at the 2020 Games, and Maria Andrzejczyk from Poland, the silver medalist at the 2020 Games. I think Maggie Malone Harden has a solid chance of meddling, and I'm excited to see how she does as she's literally the only American representing this event in the Olympics. For the long jump, we have the iconic Tara Davis Woodhall, Jasmine Moore, and Monet Nichols. In 2017, Davis Woodhall set the American Junior Women's record in the indoor long jump and placed six in the women's long jump finals at the 2020 Summer Olympics. She won the silver medal in women's long jump at the 2023 World Athletics Championships. Jasmine Moore was the first American woman to qualify for the World Athletics Championships in both the long jump and the triple jump in 2022. She competed at the 2024 World Athletics Indoor Championships in Glasgow, where she came fifth with a distance of 14.15 meters. Lastly, Nicole's finished third at the 2024 USA Indoor Track and Field Championships with a 6.73 meters distance in the long jump. She was subsequently selected for the 2024 Water Athletics Indoor Championships, where she won a silver medal with um, a distance of 6.85 meters. Malake Minhambo from Germany is the reigning Olympic champion, having won the gold medal at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics with a jump of 7.0 meters. Ivana Valletta from Serbia is a highly experienced and decorated long jumper, and she won the bronze medal at the 2016 Rio Olympics and has several world indoor and European titles to her name. And then also, S.A. Broom from Nigeria will be competing, and she won the bronze medal at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics with a jump of 6.97 6 meters. I think Tara Davis Woodhall has a solid chance of meddling, but considering the top competitors and the experience and success they have had, it's definitely going to be a, a very close competition. For the pole vault, we have Bridget Williams, Katie Moon, and Brandon King. Williams won the gold medal in the pole vault at the 2023 Pan American Games in Chile. She also finished fourth at the U.S. National Championships in Oregon in July 2023. Katie Moon won gold medals at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, 2022, and 2023 World Athletics Championships, and a silver at the 2022 World Indoor Championships. Last on the team is Bryn King, the fifth best all-time collegiate indoor competitor. She won the Division II Outdoors title in May 2024 with a height of 4.60 meters. Their competitors will be Katerina Stefaniti from Greece, the 2016 Olympic gold medalist and 2017 world champion. Holly Bradshaw from Great Britain, the bronze medalist at the 2020 Olympics, and Anita Kennedy from Australia, who won a bronze medal at the 
2022 World Indoor Championships. But I definitely think that Katie Moon and Bridget Williams can place in the top five, and I do have a lot of faith that they could also medal as well. For the shot put, the team consists of Chase Jackson, Raven Saunders, and Jada Ross. This is the one field event that is not pole ball or the longer triple jump that I am like truly confident in with the three U.S. competitors meddling. I think all three of these people had the chance of meddling or making the top five. I am really rooting for Jada Ross specifically. Competing for the University of Oregon, she finished fifth in the NCAA Outdoor Division I Championship shot put competition in 2022. Ross set a new collegiate record in the women's shot put on April 6th in La Jolla, California. I'm definitely saying that incorrectly. Um, but she, she um, broke a record set by Adelaide Akia in 2022, and Ross broke the collegiate shot put record again at the 2024 NCAA Track and Field West Regional Tournament, throwing 20.01 meters in Arkansas on May 24th, 2024. In doing so, she became the first collegiate female athlete to surpass the 20-meter mark in the shot put and just the seventh woman in American history to do that. <laughs> so that's crazy. Raven Saunders won the silver medal in the shot put at 2020 Tokyo Olympics, throwing a distance of 19.79 meters. They won two NCAA collegiate titles at Southern Illinois in the shot put and two NCAA shot put titles for the University of Mississippi as well. And then Chase Jackson won the gold medal at 2022 World Athletics Championships in the women's shot put, which made her the first American woman to win a shot put world title at the World Athletics Championship. International competitors to watch include China's Gon Lidhayo, and I'm so sorry I'm saying that incorrectly, the reigning Olympic champion who has consistently been one of the top performers in this event. Another significant tenter is Ariole Zongmo from Portugal, who has shown strong performances in recent international meets. In the women's triple jump, we have Jasmine Moore, Katura Orhi, and Tori Franklin. Orhi placed seventh at the 2020 Olympic Games and the and at the 2022 World Championships. She placed fourth this year at the World Indoor Championships. Tori Franklin won the USA Indoor Track and Field Championships and second at the US Olympic Trials for the Tokyo Games, but she ended up not competing in the actual games. Yulamar Rojas from Venezuela is the current world record holder and reigning Olympic champion in the triple jump, having set a world record with a jump of 15.67 meters at the Tokyo Olympics. Her dominance in the event makes her a favorite to win gold in Paris. Shanika Richkitz from Jamaica has been a consistent performer as well on the international stage, winning the silver medal at the 2019 World Championships and continuing to deliver strong performances in Diamond League meets. Patricia Manoma from Portugal secured the silver medal at the Tokyo Olympics with a national record jump and has been steadily improving, making her a strong contender for the podium in Paris as well. So yeah, there's a lot of competition there. Lastly, let's talk about the women's marathon. In this, we will see Fiona O'Keefe, Emily Sasson, and Dakota Lingworm. In 2022, O'Keefe won the USA 10 Mile Road Championship, and that year she placed six in the 5,000 meters at the USA TF Championships. She has not gotten much experience competing in national and international marathon competitions, but competing in other events at these types of meets, like in the 10,000 and 5,000 meters, has helped her in the marathon, which makes her one of the top contenders in the games. Sasan is more known for her success in the 10,000 meters, where she placed 10th at the 2020 Summer Olympics. Lindworm gained notoriety after winning back-to-back -back victories at Grandma's Marathon in Duluth, Minnesota in 2021 and 2022. Her victory in 2022 made her the 12th fastest U.S. women's marathoner of all time. So we're now going to move into our next segment where we talk about the NORCECA Pan American Cup Final 6. Before we dive into that, we're going to be taking a very short break, so I will see you guys very soon. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the GSMC Hoops and Heels Women's Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. 
We just got done talking about the full team USA track and field roster focusing on the field events. And now we're going to be talking about the how the U.S. women's national team did at the NORCECA Pan American Cup Final 6. For a recap, I wanted to remind you guys to like and follow the show and to become a part of our show to tip and donate using the link gsmcpodcast.net. This really helps our show and helps me too. I would really appreciate it. I also wanted to remind you guys to stay to the end of the show to hear about the top competitors to the US WT and the Olympics. So now that we got that out of the way, it is time to get started talking about the NORCEC. <laughs> <laughs> Pan American Cup Final Six. There we go. It's a very long title. So the U.S. Women's National Team competed at this event, and they got a hard-won sweep of Mexico in their first match in the Dominican Republic. Let me pull up the pictures I got here for a little slideshow. So the final scores were 33 to 31, 27 to 25, and 25 to 15. The US led Mexico in kills, 47 to 45, I mean 44 is the ratio, and dominated in blocks 14 to five. Led by middle blocker Sophie Fitcher with six blocks. Mexico led in aces, seven to four. Mexico committed 20 scoring errors while the US had 15. The US had a .365 hitting efficiency behind setter Cammy Minor, who also scored six points on four kills and two blocks. Backup setter Mia Taniga also played as a substitute. Outside hitter Jess Merzik led the U.S. scoring with 15 points on 14 kills and one block. Behind Merzik, Fisher scored 14 points on her six block, seven kills and one ace. Outside hitter Ava Hudson totaled 11 points on nine kills and two aces. Opposite Olivia Babcock added nine points on five kills, three blocks and one ace. Middle Corey Lewis scored five points on four kills and one block. Setter Mara Beeson, middles Carter Booth and Kara Chris, and outside hitter Sarah Franklin and Tara, Taylor Lanfair each scored a point as a substitute. Liberia Lana Scott also played as a substitute. So Mexico led 13 to 10 in the first set before the U.S. tied it at 14 to 14 and then led 18 to 14. Mexico came back to tie it at 20 20 and the two teams treated points. At 31-31, the U.S. got a big block from Fitcher, who followed that with a kill to give the U.S. that set to win. Mexico took a 9-6 lead in the second set, but the U.S. came back to tie at 9-9. The U.S. later led 17-13, but Mexico came back to tie at 19-19. Mexico reached set point first at 24-22, but the U.S. tied it on another Fitch, tied it on another Fisher block and Merzik kills. Mexico took set point again at 25-24. The U.S. responded with a Fisher block, Mexico hitting error, and Babcock block to win 27-25. Mexico led the third set 7-6 when Merzik scored with an attack. She took the serve and sparked the U.S. to a 4-0 run. Mexico basically never really recovered after that. Merzik said, quote, it was our first match and there were a lot of nerds and a lot of, a lot of nerves <laughs> and a lot of anxiety surrounding the game. I thought we did a good job of sticking together and battling through those hard mo moments, unquote. It literally sounded like I said nerds for a second. That's pretty funny. So the U.S. team got their second straight sweep on the Friday after, beating Canada 25 to 15, 25 to 21, and 25 to 13. The U.S. women were on point with their serves and led in aces 6-1. The U.S. led in kills 35-27 and blocks 5-3. The U.S. hit .366 behind setters Cami Minor and Mia Taniga. Leslie Rodriguez played the first set at Libera and was credited with three digs and four excellence receptions. Alina Scott took over and tallied five digs and nine excellent receptions. Outside hitter Sarah Franklin led U.S. scoring with 10 kills, one block, and one ace. She was credited with nine excellent receptions and six digs. Outside hitter Taylor Lanfair added seven kills on five, seven points on five kills, sorry, one block and one ace. Middle Corey Lewis, who started the first two sets, finished with six points on four kills and two blocks. Opposite Olivia Babcock started the first two sets and scored five points on four kills and one ace. Opposite Merritt Beeson started the third set and scored four points on four kills. Middle blocker Carrie, Chris, outside hitter Jess, Merzik, and Tanaga all played a substitute and each scored one point. Middle blocker Cardi, Carter Booth, who made her debut in a USA Volleyball jersey and scored nine points on seven kills, one block and one ace, said, I quote, I think they had some really great attackers. It was fun to get to play against some of the girls that I have seen in college volleyball, but in a different setting, unquote. 
The next game was against Puerto Rico. Against Puerto Rico, the U.S. women had to hold off several challenges, but head coach Brad Rostreder used some strategic substitutions to help get the win. Franklin led the U.S. scoring with 15 points on 13 kills, .458 hitting efficiency, and two blocks. Opposite Merritt Beeson, who played as a substitute in the first set and started the next three, scored 14 points on 13 kills and one ace. Outside hitter Ava Hudson, who also entered the match as a substitute, scored nine points on nine kills. Middle blocker Sophie Fitcher scored 13 blocks on eight kills, three blocks, and two aces. Opposite Olivia Babcock scored seven points on five kills and two blocks. Middle Carter Boost totaled five points on three kills and two blocks. Outside hitter Jess Merzik scored five points on three kills and two aces. Setter Kimmy Miner scored four points on three kills and one ace. She set the team to a .366 hitting efficiency. The teams were tied 20-20 in the first set when the U.S. scored three straight points on the Bees and kills, Puerto Rico, Era, and Fisher block. Puerto Rico scored on the U.S. service, Era. The U.S. won the match with the kills from Fisher and Franklin. Puerto Rico came back to take a 13-6 lead in the second set. The U.S. responded with an eight-point run to lead 14-13. Puerto Rico came back to lead 16 to 14 and then 21 to 16 before taking the set win. Puerto Rico led 15 to 12 in the third set. The U.S. tied it at 15-15 on a Puerto Rico error and two straight block sets by Sarah Franklin. The U.S. went on to lead 23 to 20. Puerto Rico pulled to within one at 23 to 22. The U.S. reached the set point on a bees and kill. Puerto Rico scored once more, but then served into the net to win the set. The U.S. took at 17 to 10 lead in the fourth set, and Puerto Rico basically also never covers, which is like the Mexico match as well. Outside hitter Sarah Franklin said, quote, we knew Puerto Rico was going to be riding the highs and lows, so we stayed very consistent. I think we played very well together as a team. And then where Stratter said their coach, quote, tonight was a good match for us to get tested and face some adversary. The change in adversity. Wow, I'm like not pronouncing my T's today. Okay, I'm going to redo that quote. Ross Stratter said, quote, Tonight was a good match for us to get tested and face some adversity. The changes were made in terms of getting Ava Hudson and Mara Beeson on the court really impacted the match, unquote. So the finals were held on Sunday, and the Dominican Republic beat the U.S. The U.S. finished with the tournament with a 3-1 to record. The U.S. went head-to-toe in the medal match against the Olympic qualified Dominican Republic team, falling in five sets. The scores were 25-15, to 17-25, to 23-25, 25 to 16 and 15 to 11. Ava Hudson led the U.S. with 16 digs versus the Dominican Republic, a team comprised of its Olympic qualifiers. The team attendance of 7,000 fans set a record passing previous tournaments and demonstrating the supports the sport's growing appeal in the Caribbean. Okay, so in the bronze medal match, Mexico delivered a 3 to 1 win over Puerto Rico. Canada swept the fifth place game against Cuba. And that match was the scores ended with 26 to 24, 25 to 23, 23 to 25, and 25 to 21. Dominican Republic's 27-year-old star outside hitter, Brelian Martinez, earned the Most Valuable Player Award and his spot on the Dream Team in the company of setter Cameron Minor, opposite Alondra Tapia from the Dominican Republic, outside hitter Abigail Guzan from Canada, middle blocker Snera Ortiz from Puerto Rico, and Lisville E from the Dominican Republic, and Libero Shara Venegas from Puerto Rico. Venegas also took the Best Defender Award. The Best Scorer and Best Receiver prizes went to her compatriots, Grace Lopez and Paola Santiago, while Canada's Imani Bush was recognized as the Best Server. So we're now going to move into our last segment of the day, where we preview the gymnastics team. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Where we're going to talk about the USWT's biggest comp competition in the 2024 Paris Olympics. Um, I forgot. I, like, was going to have... Um, yeah, I was going to do gymnastics at the end, but we're doing soccer at the end now. So I changed it up a little bit. Okay, so I will be right back after the break.
Welcome back to the GSMC Hoops and Heels Women's Sports Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. We just got done talking about the NORCECA Pan American Cup Final Six, and now we're going to talk about the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team's biggest competition in the 2024 Paris Olympics. Okay, let's get right into it. Okay, so... Germany will definitely be a big oops, my bad. Germany will definitely be a big competitor for the US. Germany it qualified for this year's Paris Olympics after a 2-0 win over the Netherlands in the third place playoffs of the Women's National Nations League. Clara Boo's half volley from close range of the 20 the 66th minute and Leah Schuller's header in the 78th sealed the win for Germany. Olympic gold medalists in 2016 who are returning to the games after missing Tokyo 2020 Olympics. The German team is known for its technical proficiency and tactical flexibility. Their players are skilled in ball control, passing, and movement, allowing them to maintain possession and create scoring opportunities. Their key players include midfielder Desnifer Morazan, forward Alexandra Pop, midfielder Lena Megol, midfielder Sarah Debritz, goalkeeper Almuth Schultz, and defender Marina Hegerin. Marazon is a creative playmaker known for her vision, passing, and ability to control the tempo of the game. Her technical skills and intelligence on the field make her a pivotal figure in Germany's midfield. She creates scoring opportunities for her teammates and is also a goal-scoring threat herself. Her experience and leadership are crucial for Germany's success. Pop is a versatile forward known for her physicality, aerial ability, and knack for scoring crucial goals. She can play as a striker or a winger, making her a flexible attacking option. Magul is a dynamic midfielder with excellent dribbling, passing, and goal scoring ability. Her ability to transition from defense to attack quickly and her knack for scoring from midfield positions make her a vital player for the team. Debris is known for her versatility, able to play in various midfield roles. She has excellent ball control, passing, and a powerful shot. Skoltz is an experienced and reliable goalkeeper known for her shot-stopping skills, command of the penalty area, and leadership from the back. Her presence in the goal provides Germany with a solid foundation, and that foundation is very, very crucial for the team. It's definitely under, um, not considered as much how important the goalie is in the back line. Sometimes like they are the leader of the team at a lot of points. Um, Schultz experience and composure are crucial in high-pressure situations. Lastly, Harrington is a strong physical defender known for her tackling, positioning, and ability to read the game. Her defensive skills and leadership at the back are essential for maintaining Germany's defensive stability. The team has developed strong chemistry under their current manage- management with players like Marizans and Pop leading by example both on and off the field. England will also be a strong competitor. England's physical style of play is one of their standout characteristics. They are known for their strength, stamina, and ability to outmuscle opponents. This physical approach often disrupts the rhythm of other teams and gives England an edge in one-on-one battles. Let me get into their key players. Right back Lucy Bronze is one of their best, one of the best right backs in the world, known for her defensive solidity, attacking prowess, and exceptional athleticism. She excels in both one-on-one defensive situations and contributes to the attack with overlapping runs and precise crosses. Also, the team has Fran Kirby, who is a great attacking midfielder. She's a creative playmaker with excellent vision, dribbling skills, and goal-scoring ability. She can unlock defenses with her passing and is also a opponent goal threat from midfield. Forward Ellen White is a clinical striker known for her finishing ability, intelligent movement, and work rate. Defender and midfield Leah Willemson is a versatile player and is known for her composure on the ball, precise passing, and strong defensive skills. Her leadership qualities are also vital to the team's cohesion. Lastly, forward and winger Nikita Paris is a dynamic player and excels in dribbling and has a knack for creating and scoring goals. Her agility and speed make her a constant threat on the flanks. The U.S. team will also have to look for Team France since they got that advantage of playing on home soil. Also, the French players are known for their technical proficiency. They excel in ball control, dribbling, and precise passing, making them a highly skilled team capable of maintaining possession and creating scoring opportunities. Their key players are defender Wendy Reinhardt, forward Mary Antoinette Catado, midfielder Amandine Henry, and midfielder Grace Guerrero. Grenard is a commanding commanding presence on defense, known for her height, strength, and aerial ability. She is also a significant threat on set pieces. Katoto is a prolific forward with excellent pace, dribbling skills, and finishing ability. She can score goals from various positions and situations. Henry is a versatile midfielder known for her passing vision and ability to control the tempo of the game. She's also strong defensively, too. That adds a lot to her. Guerrero is known for her work rate, tackling, and ability to break up play. She also contributes to the attack with her passing and occasional goals. 
Moving on to the Netherlands, they are a strong team for their attacking style and ability to score goals from various positions. The Dutch team has strong chemistry and a cohesive playing style. This unity is reflected in their fluid passing and coordinated movements on the field. Their key players are forward Vivian Medima, winger Leke Martens, midfielder Sheridan Spitz, defender Dominique Jensen, and goalkeeper Sari Van Venedal. Medima is one of the top forwards in the world, known for her exceptional goal scoring ability, intelligent movement, and composure in front of the goal. Martens is a creative winger with excellent dribbling skills, speed, and crossing ability. She can change the game with her offensive of contributions. Spitz is known for her leadership, passing accuracy, and set-piece expertise. She's a vital playmaker and midfielder. Jansen is a strong and reliable defender known for her tackling positioning and aerial ability. Lastly, Van Vinadel is an experienced goalkeeper with excellent shot-stopping ability, command of the penalty area, and leadership from the back. The last two teams I wanted to mention are Brazil and Zambia. They are more known for their individual players that make them a threat to the U.S. team. Brazil is consistently a oh that's a Zambia my bad. Brazil is consistently a strong contender in women's soccer. Their iconic players are forward Marta, midfielder and forward Dominia, midfielder Formiga, midfielder and forward Adressa Alves, and forward Lumila. Marta is a legendary forward known for her skill, vision, and goal scoring ability. She is capable of producing moments of magic that can turn a game on its head. She also leads in the Olympics and World Cups for some of the most goals scored. Dabinia is a creative and dynamic player with excellent dribbling skills, pace, and vision. She can unlock defenses with her passing and is also a opponent goal threat. Formiga brings immense experience and stability to the midfielder midfield. Known for her work rate, tackling, and passing accuracy, she controls the tempo of the game. Adressa Alves is a versatile and skillful player, known for her dribbling, shooting, and set-piece expertise. She can play in various attacking roles. Lastly, Lamila is known for her incredible pace, strength, and goal-scoring ability. She excels mainly in one-on-one -on -one situations as a constant threat on counterattacks. All of these players have insane speed that makes them such good opponents. And then going back to Zambia, sorry guys, the presentation was out of order. Zambia is known for its athletic players who bring a lot, and I mean a lot, of speed and agility to the game. Their quick transitions and ability to exploit space make them a dangerous counter-attacking team. This pace allows them to break quickly from defense to attack, catching opponents off guard. First, we have to talk about forward Barbara Banda. Y'all know I'm a huge fan of Banda. She's a prolific goal scorer known for her speed, strength, and clinical fishing, finishing. She has a knack for finding the back of the net and can score from various positions. Banda's goal scoring ability and leadership on the field make her a key player for the Zambia team. Her presence in the attack is a constant threat to defenses. In the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, she made headlines by scoring back-to-back hat-tricks, showcasing her extraordinary talent. Also on the team is Grace Chanya, who can play both in midfield and forward roles. Chanya's ability to link up play and her offensive contributions are crucial for Zambia's success. She plays a pivotal role in transitioning the team from defense to attack. Rachel Nachula is a forward who brings pace and agility. She is known for her ability to beat defenders and create scoring opportunities. Her ability to break down defenses with her quick movements is vital for the team. Lastly, Mizozi Zula, Zulu sorry, is a star on the team. Zulu is known for her work rate, tackling, and ability to disrupt the opponent's play. She also has good vision skills and passing skills, contributing to the team's attacking efforts. Her role in breaking up play and initiating counterattacks is definitely very crucial. Her defensive capabilities help provide balance to the team as well. So that concludes our show for today. Thank you guys for tuning in to the GSMC Hoops and Heels Women Sports Podcast presented to you by the GSMC Sports Network. Your support means a lot to us, so please remember to subscribe to the show and leave a positive review. It really does make a difference. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram for more content and updates. Thank you guys once again and have a wonderful 4th of July if you celebrate it, and if not, have a wonderful day. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Yeah, damn, ain't that great. I don't wanna go. To